Okay, I want to look at 6.3 and a half. This is the trickiest of the problems on page 100. It's actually a, a pretty decent exam level difficulty problem. Um, again, page 100 at the bottom, 6.3 and a half. So to give you a visual on this, give me just a second. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and give you a visual here and hopefully not hurt myself in the process. So now, oh my gosh, this is getting kind of tricky. I'm, these problems are getting sneakier and sneakier, right? Okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put this mass on here. Now, if I let go of it, it's gonna slide. So I'm gonna hold it with my chin for a second. All right, then you can do this. This is getting ridiculous, isn't it? All right, so now hopefully you can see this whole thing here. I hope this looks, whoa, where do I want to go? Maybe right here? Oh my gosh, this is difficult. So I'm going to pull this thing at some angle and hope, oh my gosh, all right, it's falling apart. But this is supposed to be the idea. You pull it at some angle on the top block and then there's a hanging block as well. Let me put this down before I hurt myself. Oh my gosh, it totally fell apart. That's fine. But the idea is I was pulling on this block. That was the scale I was pulling on. And so hopefully if we pull on this with enough force, this is actually going to start going upwards. So uh, in this case, I'm assuming it's sliding. Maybe I'll make that assumption clear here. So here, I'm assuming it's going to move this way. We see already why these problems are a lot harder, right? If you apply too little force, it might actually slide downwards. That's why I had to put my chin on there. So in this case, I'm looking for the minimum amount of force to cause slipping this way, all right? On a different test question, I could ask the same thing and say, what is the largest force you could apply before it slips the other way? All right, fine. Um, in addition, uh, I guess I'm going to make the assumption uh, um, M1 stays on the board. That's another big assumption we're making here. You could see that in that particular one, I think I actually lifted the pucks off the board and it was falling all over. So we've got to be clear here. We're assuming that the block stays on the board and we're assuming that we want sliding this way. And now I want to address these questions. Whoa, this is starting to look like a real engineering problem, right? We have to make a list of assumptions and clearly state what we want to figure out uh, based off these assumptions. Let's go down here. Uh, I'm going to assume that mu static, mu kinetic, theta, and the two masses and G are our knowns, and that F is some variable force you could apply. And so in this case, uh, I could use zero newtons, 20 newtons, whatever. So we're gonna to need to learn what value of force causes this thing to slide that way. And then what is the acceleration magnitude if I apply twice as much force? Okay, uh, you think what you would do at this point, and I'll show you what I would do. If you wanna pause the video to think about it, now that we've talked, go ahead and do that. Okay, here I go. How would I start it? In reality, we do not want to have this thing on the verge. We want to see how much it accelerates, but we first need to consider the case if it is on the verge. A lot like the last problem, that gives us an over-under for understanding things. So I'm going to first consider on the verge. What does that mean? In this case, it would mean friction is mu static times the normal force. Notice it's not mu static mg. It's mu static times the normal force. Sometimes n equals mg, sometimes it doesn't. In this one, it probably doesn't equal mg, all right? Now, in this particular case, on the verge of slipping means uh, acceleration equals zero. Now, you might be saying, well, dude, is it ever going to have non-zero acceleration when it's on the verge? Absolutely. You can have a case where, for example, you could have a block that's sitting on a moving vehicle. And then it might actually be accelerating when it's on the verge of slipping. So um, you got to be careful here. 
usually on the verge of slipping means a is equal to zero, but not always, not always. Okay, um, I could show you a worked example later. All right, but in this case, if it's on the verge, we're gonna assume that. Now I could do an FBD for these things. Well, in this case, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to assume uh, that, uh, you know, for no good reason, I'm gonna call this the Y direction and this the X direction for this block. Do you remember what we did for pulleys? When we rotate, when our thumb follows that string, I'm gonna say this direction is up. So I'm actually gonna call this the X direction and this the Y direction. Let me make sure that's right. X, uh, because we want this thing to accelerate this way in the long run, I'm gonna call that the positive X direction. Could you do this with a different coordinate system? Absolutely. Your labels might look a little bit different than mine, but your equations should be the same as mine. Again, listen, the labels for what force in X and Y might change a little bit, but the equations we actually write for those labels should be the same for you and me, even if you choose a different one. Now, in this particular case, I know it's not accelerating, but I'm gonna label this as the acceleration direction because ultimately in the long run, we're gonna assume it does accelerate. For this first part, A is equal to zero, but that's the direction it is going to accelerate later on. Now I'm gonna do an FBD for one. In this case, there's a force this way that's applied at some angle theta. This side is opposite, that's F cosine theta. This side is adjacent, that's F sine theta. There's a weight downwards that's not mg, it's m1g, because that's block one. Two blocks, different masses, you might have m1, m2g. There's a normal force upwards on this one. I'm gonna call that normal force one because it's from the floor or the table upwards on one. And then, ooh, what's this? Tension. We looking good? No, we forgot friction. There's friction in this problem. Ah! Okay, so I'm gonna assume there's also friction this way. Now, to be clear in this problem, my move is to generally write the same subscript for my frictional force and my normal force. What do I mean by that? Normal force one is the normal force upwards on block one from the table. Well, that's the same interface, right? The normal force is coming from this interface where the friction is coming from. So, right, it makes sense that this friction one is associated with normal force one. Why? Oh, that helps me up here. In problems with multiple normal forces, it helps me see which normal force I plug in. So in this particular case, oh, it's not that confusing. There's only one normal force, but in problems with multiple, that would be nice. Now, in this case, uh, we're saying A equals zero. So I don't need to worry about the coordinate system on this particular picture or FBD2. On FBD2, what do we get? There's a tension upwards. There's a... M2G downwards, and A is equal to zero. So in this particular case, tension equals M2G, not MG, not M1G, M2G. And over here, we see the normal force. Oh boy, that's gonna be a little bit complicated. Uh, let's write out the force equations on this. So I'm gonna say, if A is equal to zero, the left force is equal to right. So I'm gonna say, uh, oh, wait a minute. I screwed up, didn't I? I totally screwed up here. These are totally wrong. I don't know why I did that. This one is adjacent. Shouldn't that be cosine? And this one is opposite. Shouldn't that be, oh, geez, I just did it again. That should be sine theta. I apologize for that. I'm glad I caught it before I recorded this video and sent it out to you. I apologize if you felt uncomfortable. I was wrong. You were right. Okay. Well, we caught it here. Here we go. So now left's equal to right's F cosine theta. This is the advantage, by the way, of having the solutions in the workbook. If you see something like this, you can always check the solutions to the workbook and see if I just made a typo on the video or if it was a typo in the solution. Okay, go ahead and do that. Uh, and then here, I'm going to say friction from source one 
and tension. I'm going to see if I screwed this up. This is to the left. These are to the right because A is equal to zero. The lefts equal the rights. That's good. Now, in this case, because A is zero, the ups equal the downs. Ooh, I get N1 plus F sine theta. That's the ups equal the downs. This is what I was saying. Whenever you have an angled force, the normal force does not equal mg. In fact, here I can see that the normal force is equal to m1g minus f sine theta. Well, what if that force is too big? Hey, we already made an assumption that it's not. Sweet, right? So if this force got too big, the normal force would be negative. That doesn't make sense. That's what means the block lifts off. Well, in this case, over here, I see T equals M2G. Why? A is equal to zero right now. So in this case, what are we trying to do? Figure out the minimum value of F to cause slipping. So that means we're trying to solve for capital F and all this junk. But our final answer has to be in terms of known quantities. So our final answer should be in terms of these variables. That means F is not allowable. The frictional coefficient mu is allowable, but frictional force F, that's not known right now. Huh. Why don't you think what you would do? Here we go. If you want to pause the video, last chance. All right, here we go. I would say I can figure out this normal force and plug it into there and get something for low, lowercase f1 in terms of mg and capital F. I could use this to eliminate the unknown t. And then when I plug that all in, I should be able to group the capital Fs and solve for it. Let's go. So in this case, F1 is going to be mu static times normal force one. Ugh. Normal force one is all this garbage. And then the tension, that one's not so bad. That's from right there. At this point, our goal is to figure out F, capital F. Well, I have a capital F here and a capital F there. I need to group those capital Fs. I've run out of space. I'm gonna put this on the other whiteboard. See if you can beat me to the answer. Try to solve this equation, this and this, for capital F. I'm just going to rewrite and then I'll move the screen over. What did I say? F cosine theta is equal to all that garbage. Mu static times a whole bunch of junk. F sine theta. Plus M2G. Okay, now I'm going to move it over. So again, that's just the same equation as before. I'm trying to solve for capital F. Hmm. Put that over here. There's a cosine theta from this one. Now I'm going to move this over. It becomes positive, and I get a mu static sine theta. A lot of these problems end up taking this form. So this is actually pretty typical of exam level difficulty in a lot of physics course, courses. Okay, It may seem crazy, but you get used to it. All right, so now I guess it's, you could group this in all kinds of ways. I believe that's the right answer. We got capital F 
and it's only on one side of the equation, like a common mistake is people say, oh, just divide by this junk. Well, oops. some people say just divide by cosine theta, but that doesn't get the job done because there's a capital F on this side. You got to group those first. I think this looks good. I'm going to do a quick check. There's lots of different checks you could do. Um, for example, you could say, oh, does this problem match up to the previous one when I set theta equal to zero, perhaps, or something like that? Or um, in this case, I'm going to at least check the units. What are the units of mu? No units. Times kilograms plus kilograms times meters per second squared all over. This is a function. No units. No units. No units. There are no units in the basement. Well, no units times kilograms. That gets absorbed. It's kilograms. Kilograms plus kilograms, that's just kilograms. A kilogram meter per second squared is a newton. Units, whoa. The units check. Good. We could do some quick cases. We could think if M1 gets really big, I need more force to pull it. If M2 gets really big, I need more force to pull it. That seems reasonable. If I have more friction, right? If I have a larger frictional coefficient, we should get more. We should require more force to make this move if I have a larger frictional coefficient. If I change the angles, that's maybe a little bit trickier. I'd probably, in a real world, maybe make a simulation and think about it and try special cases like theta equals zero. Uh, hopefully it's easy. And, well, I don't know. This is tricky because if you pull at an angle, you reduce the normal force, you reduce the maximum possible amount of friction. This is not an easy problem to just think your way through at this point. That said, this is a special value of force F. I'm going to put that label on here now. All right. So you might be saying, what? What do you mean? This is the special force that caused it to slide to the left. Again, if I go to my picture, we're saying, what is the minimum amount to cause slipping this way? That was our assumption. Well, now I know that value is, whoa. This. Great. The second question said, well, let's go back to there. So we've got that value. We can come back to it if we need it. Now we want to know what is the acceleration if I apply twice as much force? Well, if I apply double that force, what should happen to it? Again, we're going to assume we want sliding this way and that the mass stays on the board. So I'm not going to pull so hard that the pucks come flying up off the board. Well, I want you to think to yourself, could we still use these FBDs? Could we still use these force equations? Yes or no? I'll give you a second. Pause the video and think. Can we still use these FBDs? Can we still use these force equations? Yes or no? The FBDs are essentially just fine, but the equations are total lies now. That's where you watch out. People are like, ah, it's basically the same. Yeah, the FBD hasn't changed. The forces are still applied in the same manner. But this is obviously not true anymore. If it's accelerating upwards, doesn't T have to be bigger than that? So our force equations are no longer true. Since you've got this in a video, what I would like to do is erase this, erase this, and this. We are no longer on the verge of slipping, so we can't use that. So these force equations are no longer good. But we can still use the FBDs. In this case, this object I chose to say is accelerating in this direction. You might say, why are you doing it that way? Everybody remembers F equals MA. If I align the coordinate system such that A is in the same direction, I write F equals M times positive A. If I use this coordinate system, I'd have to say, oh, yeah, F equals M times negative A, because A points opposite the direction of the coordinate system. That's why I choose to do this. You do whatever you got to do, but if your equations are not the same as mine, you did it wrong. Now, in this case, I'm going to call this the X direction and this the Y direction. I know that feels really dumb. Just trust me. All I'm trying to do is say, look, that way is the positive x direction in this problem. Again, this way is the positive x direction. It seems weird. It's fine. It's just a coordinate system. Don't trip out. All right. Well, when I write these force equations now, 
Now I better pay attention. This one's positive. These two are negative. And that's it, left or right. And so this is equal to M1A. It's not MA. You got to get the right mass. Come on, signal. Do not enter power saving mode. And then up and down. Oh, oh, that equation doesn't change. Isn't that interesting? The force equation in the vertical direction doesn't change because acceleration in the y direction is still zero. So I could have kept that one. I've forgotten what it is, so I'm just going to rewrite it again. I think I get F sine theta plus normal force one is equal to the downward force, which is M1G. So in this case, I was wrong. We could have actually saved this one force equation, but that one we can't and that one we can't. Over here, this one is with the coordinate with A, so T and A should be positive. M2G should be negative. That's not always true. What if this was falling down and pulling it that way? Oh, well, things might be different. This had better be M2 times A. Did you remember the subscript for two? All right. In this case, uh, we're actually sliding. If F is greater than F min to cause sliding, sliding occurs. I know that seems crazy. Why am I mentioning this? Look, if you pull harder than the minimum amount, sliding occurs. Friction is mu kinetic times the normal force. So in this particular case, if it's actually sliding, not only do we get acceleration, but we have to remember to change the friction equation. All right. Well, I can see that it's probably going to be handy to solve for N1, so I'm going to regroup here. Why? If I put N1 in here, then I can have an answer here. So let's uh, N1 is equal to M1G. All right. And now at this point, the process is very similar. It's a little bit uglier because we have acceleration now. But look, I could take this normal force, shove it into here, get a big long mess, and shove that into here for the frictional force. I could solve this equation for T and shove that garbage into here. And then I'm trying to solve for A if I know that this force is some special value. So what I'll do is I'll solve this equation for A and then see how it works out. Now, another move that you might think about doing is actually stacking these equations. Rather than solving this one for T and plugging it in, if we stack these two equations and add them, tension, the internal force between the one, two system should drop right out. So I'm actually going to set this up on the other board and uh, yeah, see if you could solve for the acceleration faster than me or maybe, I don't know. I'm just going to copy these equations over and then I'll move the board over. Give me a second, will you? So I know in this case, F cosine theta minus T minus F1 equals M1A A is red color, isn't it? And then I got this other one. I promise I'm moving the board over. I'll just give me a couple more seconds here. All right. Well, I got a couple other things. I'm going to write that too. N1, we said, was M1G minus F sine theta. Okay, now I can move the board over. All right, this was our result from last time. Let's just hang on to that there. Now, in this case, here's what I was trying to tell you earlier. I can get rid of this force T, which is unknown, by stacking these two equations and adding them. I like doing it that way for the following reason. I'll know I'm doing things correctly if I get mass total times A. 
this makes me feel un, uh, this makes me feel pretty comfortable. I usually get if I stack my equations and add them, the internal forces usually drop out, and I usually get mass total times a. So I'm feeling comfortable. That doesn't mean I'm right, but it looks like most problems I do. That's a good sign. Next, I could plug in that this one, because they're in relative motion now, now I'm going to use F1 equals mu kinetic times normal force one. And again, normal force one is right here. So notice we do not have uh, mu static on our frictional force anymore. It's mu kinetic. I pulled too hard. It's actually sliding now. So let's shove that in there. What's that normal force? This is a hard problem now, actually. This is, this is a really hard problem. I love it. I don't know. And if you're following along thinking, it's hard, but I can follow along. That's awesome. So I, I picked a really hard one. I hate it when teachers always do the easy one in class and then give you the impossible one. You're like, oh. So hopefully this, even though it's difficult, makes you feel a little bit better. The question was, what is the acceleration when you plug in F is twice the minimum? Now, you can start plugging this in right now, but that's a terrible idea. I'm going to group the capital Fs first and then plug in. So in this case, I'm going to get capital F times, now i got to be careful here. There's a cosine theta from this one. Over here, I have a minus times a minus, which is a positive mu kinetic sine. Double check. I get a cosine theta here, and then I get a negative times a negative, which is a positive for this term, a mu kinetic sine, and the F factors out. That's looking pretty good. But I got to remember the rest of this junk minus M2G minus mu kinetic M1G. Now let's make sure I didn't miss any terms. These two are right here. This two right here and here. Let me see. At this point, I could plug in F min times two. So while this is going to look a little bit crazy here, let me make this stand out. Let me get a different color. What is that purple or something? Here it is. What we want to do is this F is now equal to two times F min. So I'm going to take this result from part A, multiply it by two, and shove it in there. Ugh, gauza. Okay, who cares? It's two. Now let me write that in purple so I don't screw it up. Two times mu static m1 plus m2 quantity times g all over this garbage. Oh, oh, it looks like it's going to cancel, but it doesn't. It's just horrible. Maybe sure I didn't screw it up. Two times this. I got my two. I got the numerator, mu static in one, two. Cosine theta, mu static side. Okay, all that times this garbage, which is cosine theta plus mu kinetic sine theta, woo, minus M2G minus M1G equals M1 plus M2 quantity times A. Let me make sure that's still on the whiteboard. That's a bad sign, isn't it? Yowza. Okay. At first glance, it looks like this should cancel this, but it doesn't. Why? This is a mu kinetic. This is a mu static. You might say, well, no, this is just it. It's ugly. So if I want to solve for A, I have to take this and divide the whole thing over here oh, by M1 plus M2. This is crazy. Yeah. If you're thinking this is nuts, it is nuts. But I hope you agree that it's not any one step that's difficult. It's just the algebra starts to get a little bit long. 
usually on a test question, I wouldn't make it this bad. This, this was particularly, particularly awful. Um, a trick that you can make this easier is you could say M1 equals M2 equals N, and then a lot of the Ms start to drop out and it cleans up a lot. Uh, or I could say mu static equals mu kinetic for this problem, and then this would actually cancel out and the result factors down a lot easier. Um, or if I actually gave you numbers, you could plug in numbers. But out of all this, we did achieve the goal. We first found the minimum force to cause slipping, then we doubled it and figured out what the acceleration was. That's a hard one. Uh, give yourself a pat on the back if you made it all the way through that.